it was tough. And then I remember getting a call from the network. Be like, hey, we understand. Like, we can stop the show. And I'm like, we're yeah. not stopping anything. Love that. Uh, we are not stopping. So if you actually watch the early seasons of, of Flip or Flop, you see me gain 60 pounds on TV. Wow. Like, you, you see me filming sick. Like, I was throwing up every day. And it was a tough experience. But I never quit. Like, I was filming, rolling into my surgery a week after my surgery. I was back on camera. And I had a tube coming out of my neck. Oh. And, I, and I just always fought for what I wanted. And, and I really, that's what it takes to be a successful entrepreneur. Like, you have to chase your dreams. All right. Uh, joining us from Newport Beach, California, in the comfort of his own home, it's Mr. Tarek El Moussa. Tarek, welcome to the show, my man. Thank you for having me. Yeah, excited to jump into this conversation. A lot to discuss. But uh, before we get into it, I want to give us a brief overview of what you were like as a kid growing up, middle school and going through high school, and then your transition and start in real estate. All right. Well, I was the kid that was always in trouble. Um, I had to do kindergarten twice because apparently I wasn't mature enough. <laughs> Um, I spent most of my childhood sitting outside of classrooms and uh, I was never really behaved in class, mostly because I just had so much energy. I didn't know what to do with myself. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I was diagnosed ADHD and um, throughout my whole life, you know, teachers were always upset with me and they would always tell me all the time how I couldn't do things and, yeah. and, and why, I, why I was struggling and I needed to calm down. I needed to change. And throughout my whole life, I was always told, you know, I had problems. And mm -hmm. then what I did is I took all of that negative feedback and it really fueled my success as an entrepreneur because I'm a really driven person. And I think a yeah. lot of my drive comes from people telling me I can't do something. Yeah. So one of my favorite things to do is prove someone wrong when they tell me I can't do something. Yeah. And I've actually done that over and over again, like getting into real estate. People said I couldn't do it. Getting on TV. Mm -hmm. People said I couldn't do it. Flipping houses. People said I yeah. couldn't do it. So it's really fueled me. Yeah, that's that's I have a lot of similarities in how I grew up. I just I hated school. I uh, never thought I was good at it. And uh, once I found real estate, things turned around. But uh, why don't you walk us through what it was like jumping into real estate? I know you got your start early on. Uh, walk us through what that was like. Yeah. So I, I say this all the time. You know, you can be the, the most excited, hungry, motivated yeah person in the world right but <laughs> yeah. like if you don't have guidance if you don't have a mentor if you don't know what to do like honestly it's really hard to find success so mm -hmm. for me real estate my first six months in the business i was 20 years old right out of high school like got wow. into real estate on a whim like so I, young i was selling cutco kitchen knives Ugh. i lost my sales book and i literally <laughs> put myself out of business and i found myself at an atm in cerritos california and i remember having a moment like man i'm out of money what am i going to do and this is a true story I, I looked up to the right and there was a crooked sign. Mm. It said, wise old owl, real estate school. And I had what I like to call a defining moment. And sure. a defining moment is a moment in your life that changes the trajectory of your life. Mm. And, I, and I thought to myself, I was like, you know, I, could, I was selling the shit out of these knives, man. I bet you I could sell <laughs> houses. So I literally took money out of my account, walked across the parking lot and signed up for real estate classes. And then I got in the business, young, hungry, motivated. My first six months in the business, completely struck out. What year is this? This was 2000, uh, 2002, 2003. Okay. Like right out of high school. This I'm like, talking, like yeah. I traded in my lifted truck. I bought a 1985 baby blue Buick Park Avenue. Went to JC Penney, bought the slacks, like the whole thing. <laughs> I was a kid, you know? Yeah. And, um, you know, six months in, I, I made no money, no sales. And I was so defeated. I was like, I've been waiting my whole life to become an adult, become successful, and I'm failing. Mm -hmm. And I'd, I'd always thrived throughout high school with sports and stuff. So I was used to winning. And then yeah. all of a sudden I became an adult and I'm just losing every single day. Mm -hmm. And it really takes a toll on you. Um, but it's because I didn't have the experience, right? So I, I talked to my parents and I was telling them, you know, I'm thinking about leaving this real estate thing. My, my dad's like, no, stick with it. My mom's like, go back to college. My mom has like a PhD. So she's stu super educated. Yeah, yeah. And, and, I, and I decided to give it one more shot. Uh, shortly after that, I checked um, in my office and there was a free coaching event coming into town and it was a Buena Park Sequoia Athletic Club. Mm -hmm. And the gentleman who was doing the speaking was named Mike Ferry. So anyone okay. that's a real estate agent yeah, knows Mike Ferry. Big time. And I was like, Mike Ferry was, I was, I was like his biggest fan. Yeah. Like he is, like when I was young, that's who I wanted to be. Like mm -hmm. I was obsessed with Mike. So I go to this event and by the time the event's over, man, Mike is, is just powerful. Like he convinced me anything's possible. Mm. I mean, he convinced me I can be more successful than I ever imagined. Like he put this belief that I can accomplish anything. So at the end of this free event, um, I handed him a, a note. It was on a yellow piece of paper and it said, you don't know who I am today, but one day you will. Mm. And I signed it Tarek El Moussa. I love and that. by the way, he knows who I am today. <laughs> so I ended up signing up for coaching and you got to think about this. I'm 20 years old. I have no money. I have yeah. no money. Coaching is a thousand bucks a month. Yeah. So I signed up on my credit card. At the time, my parents just got divorced. Me and my girlfriend broke up 
and I had nowhere to go because I was living with my girlfriend. Mm. So I called my mom and I was like, hey, mom, I need to move back home. And she goes, well, I just rented out your bedroom. <laughs> I'm like, okay, well, that's going to be a problem. So I was like, well, can I stay in the garage? And she's like, I mean, if you want to sleep with cockroaches and rats, I'm like, sure. <laughs> Damn, you, know, you were in rats, the garage. But, you know, mice. We had mice. Yeah. I'm like, all right, I'll stay in the garage. So literally I hit the clicker and I, and I went and bought a cot and I rolled it into the middle of the garage. So it was like my dirt bike, my jet ski, spray paint can. It was like a real <laughs> garage. So to give you the picture, I'm living in this garage. I'm like rock bottom. What year is this? 2002, 2003. Again. Okay. And um, I'm putting a thousand dollars a month on my card for coaching. Wow. Thousand bucks back then was like a million dollars, right? So I was like, man, if, I, if I'm putting a thousand dollars a month towards, I'm going to work my ass off. So I made a deal with myself. The deal was simple. I gave myself 20 year old Tart. You got, you have 90 days to make something happen in real estate, or you're going back to school. Mm. Like that was the deal. I looked in the mirror and I made that deal with myself. And what I did is I worked six days a week three hours Sunday night. And I would start about 7.30 in the morning until 8.30, 9 o'clock every single night. Mm. And here's what happened. <laughs> 90 days later, I look up and I realize I was, I was earning $120,000 in commissions Oof. by getting listings and selling houses. So within a 90 day period, I went from being this broke kid living in his mom's garage to 90 days later, I had made $40,000 every single month. Yeah. That's and sad. from there, I ended up buying an almost million dollar house in Orange County, California. So within like a four or five month period, I went from no money to living in this like mansion. At least yeah. for me, it was a mansion back then. It was in a, it was in a neighborhood that, you know, I thought w wealthy people lived in because mm -hmm. I grew up in a park, you know, right. we have the nice areas like yeah. that. And I thought I had made it. Right. So, but I will say, you know, success with real estate, you know, people say, oh, it takes years. I'm like, well, not really. Mm -hmm. Like if you know sales, you can find success in real estate really, really fast. 100%. I'm talking months. Yeah. Like people say it takes years. It doesn't take years. You just have to know what to do. Yeah. So then real estate agent, I started thriving, built teams. 2007 came around, 2006, 7, 8. I had to sell everything I owned. Mm -hmm. So I stopped selling my listings. I stopped making money. And at the time, you know, I was 21 years old, 22 years old, living in this million dollar house. I had a mortgage. I had car payments. I had all these adult problems as a kid. So I knew my income was dropping. So I sold my house, I sold my cars, and I ended up moving into this tiny little apartment wow. by the time I was 25, 26. And I had a roommate, and that was my second rock bottom. So I hit my first rock bottom, 1920, my second rock bottom, 25, 26, because literally I had to sell everything I owned. That's crazy. Yeah, so it was about starting over again. Wow. Yeah. Well, I love in the beginning, like you went all in in yeah. that 90-day stretch, and you just went crazy. You're probably doing a lot of cold calling, oh, sourcing oh, yeah. new clients. Um, but you went all in and then you made it and then lost it all in 2008. Um, a lot of people lost their ass in 2008. Yep. Um, and so then talk about like, what was that transition like from there? Where, where did you go and how did you get in this flipping thing and getting on TV? Walk us through that. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I was, this is now say 2008, I'm done 2008, <laughs> nine, I'm defeated. And I've always had a lot of confidence in myself and I'll never, rem I'll never forget. There was this one day I was living in Newport beach in this apartment and I was sitting on the patio. I had left work, it was like three in the afternoon, which I never did. Mm. And I actually thought to myself, maybe you're not as good as you think you are. Mm. Maybe you're not meant to have the things you want. Mm. And that was the first time in my life I doubted what I could accomplish. Within minutes, I said, Tariq, you're an idiot, <laughs> you're yeah. wrong, and I kept going. So here's what I did. I never stopped doing what I was doing. I was prospecting expired listings like crazy. My income went from a couple hundred thousand dollars a year to like 80 to a hundred thousand dollars a year, but I had a lot of bills. and. Then I started learning about short sales. Mm. So then what I would do is I started doing handwritten letters to notice the default properties. Next thing I know, I started getting short sales. And I did this one short sale transaction. There was a first lien, second lien, third lien, IRS lien, HOA lien. I mean, I had a lien on the lien, like so many liens. Yeah, yeah. And I negotiated this deal for like 11 months. And it was exhausting working with the banks. Because back then there was no organization, there were no systems, it was a free for all. And at the end of the day, I got a check for 7,000 bucks. Mm -hmm. And then I watched the, the, the investor I sold the house to, he painted it, he cut the lawn, sold it like two weeks later, it made like 127,000. <laughs> and that was the exact moment I realized I was on the wrong side of the equation. It's time to pivot. It was time to pivot. Yeah. So at that moment I said, man, I gotta, I gotta flip houses. So then I, I, of course, I do what everybody does. I went to everybody I knew about my great idea of flipping houses. And every single person I talked to shot it down. You're too young. You don't have experience. It's too speculative. They gave me every single reason why I would fail. Like yeah. every single reason. Not one person told me, yes, you could do it. 
Mm -hmm. So because so many people told me I, I would fail, my, my, my gas tank got fuller and fuller and fuller, and I got more irritated, and I was like, okay, I'm really going to prove people wrong. So I finally... I finally and real quick, I feel like that is something that a lot of people getting to start in real estate or they're starting whatever it might be. Everyone tells them, hey, it's not going to work out. They hear the noise from their friends, their family. And it's not because they're against them. It's just because they love them and they just don't get it. Yeah, you know well, what I mean? Well, here's the biggest problem in our society, right? Yeah. So, we, you know, we're always coaching and teaching people like, you know, talk to successful people. Yeah. The problem is. I hate to say it, most people don't know what success looks like. So a lot of most people live in a middle class neighborhood and their neighbor drives a C-class Mercedes and they think they're successful. So then they right. go to them for advice. But the person driving the C-class Mercedes living in a middle class neighborhood isn't the person to give them advice. 100%. They need to, they need to get advice from world renowned entrepreneurs because there's no yeah. successful real estate investor that would ever tell someone not to become a real estate investor. 100%. Like there's not one. Would you ever tell someone don't get into real estate? Not in a million years. I would never do but that. But I hear so many people never get started because their parents talked them out of it or their best friend talked them out of it or their ex-wife. Yeah. How many <laughs> houses did your parents flip? None. Oh, right. okay. How many investments do they have? None. Right. Okay. How many deals has your yeah. ex-wife done? None. Okay. So yeah. why in the world would you take advice? Like From someone I'm, that's never done it. <laughs> I, I'm not going to go take fitness advice from the guy in and out drive through. Like, you know, I'm just saying, <laughs> right, right? Like right. you got to, you got to choose where you take your advice. Yeah. Right. So I think it's important to get advice from the right people. Um, where was I going with this? Oh, uh, we were, 2000, uh, yeah. 2008, 2009. Okay. So then I started going after short sales mm -hmm. and, um, I started making money again and then I pitched everybody I knew. And then I finally got someone to give me money and it was someone that was successful. His mm -hmm. name was Pete DeBest and he was already a multimillionaire. And the craziest thing is I was like, Hey dude, like I put together this little one sheet business plan. I was like, Hey, you want to flip houses with me? He goes, all right. And I was like, huh? He's like, all right. He's like, if you find a deal, all right. I'm like, really? He's like, yeah, of course. And I was like, I was like, it's that easy. So I realized you just got to find the right people because the yeah. people that understand uh, investing, the people that understand real estate, the people that are entrepreneurs, they're going to understand investing where the, where the mm -hmm. masses don't. So then we, we did our first deal together. We bought a condo in Santa Ana, California, paid 115000 for this thing. Holy cow. Yeah. And I did everything, man. Like I picked up the appliances. I picked up the material. I was painting the walls, painting the baseboards. Like I electrocuted myself on the vanity. I burned my feet with acid. Yeah. Like I butchered this thing. So, so this investor put in the capital and then you did all the work and you guys just split the profits? Exactly. So okay. the deal was pretty simple. Yep. I do everything. He gives me the money and we split it 50-50. Yep. So that was the deal. So the same week that we bought that deal, um, Mike Ferry was throwing a big event. Mm -hmm. So I ended up going out to Las Vegas for the Mike Ferry event. And we all, I always would sit in the very back, you know, because there's 5,000 people there. And yeah. the, the front rows for the VIPs and yeah. people that pay the big dollars, which I wasn't there yet. And my friend was the vice president of uh, Prudential Real Estate. Ooh. And um, his manager and the manager's wife left the front row of Mike Ferry's event. So he texts me in the back. He's like, hey, you want to want to come up to the front? And I was like, heck yeah, I want to come to the front. So... I go to the front and here's the cool part. The night before, Mike Ferry was on stage and he told all of us, go have a dinner you can't afford. Drink wine you can't afford. Go buy clothing you can't afford. And I did it. So the night before this event, I bought this Zania suit, it was 800 bucks. And I was like, <laughs> man, I can't believe I spent 800 bucks on a suit. I took my ex-wife, we went to like Gucci, we got all this <laughs> stuff. Like we had, and to this day, it was one of the most amazing nights of our life because sure. we were living that next level. We yeah. ordered fancy wines and pastas. Yeah. Like, Just to taste it was it. an experience, right? Mm -hmm. So now I'm like fired up. I'm in the front row. I'm yeah. in my Zania suit looking sharp. And at the break, we just started mingling to the people in the front, the VIPs. They're like, hey, who are you guys? Like we were young, decent looking, and they had never seen us before. Mm -hmm. So I started talking to one guy and he's telling me how he has a local TV show in Palm Springs. And I was like, a TV show? That's cool. Like to be known and stuff. And he's like, well, what does that do? He's like, well, like, I go places and people recognize me. I'm like, okay, well, what does that do? <laughs> and then he's like, well, then they work with me. They buy and sell their houses with me. I'm like, man, that is genius. He's, so he's told me how he built a brand sure. through like local paid programming. So I'm like, man, that is smart. And he was on stage that day talking about how he had made $800,000 that year. And for me back then, 800,000, I was like, that's impossible. Right, right. right. That's a big money. Yeah, that's a big money. So I go home after the event. Um, I think it was a day or two later. And this is what, what year is this? This now? is now 2010. And this is before social media really became what it is today. Yeah. So building a brand back then was way different, I yeah. imagine. Yeah. Way different. Way different. So, so it, now it's like we're back in San Clemente, California. Yeah. That's where we were living. I'll never forget. It was 10 o'clock at night. My ex-wife is walking up the stairs. She has one foot going up the stairs. She looks over and she's like, you coming to bed? I was like, no. I'm like, I'm going to get us a TV show. 
And she starts <laughs> laughing at me because my whole life I say crazy shit and people think I'm kidding and I'm not. Mm-hmm. And I said, I'm going to get us a TV show. Love and she goes, TV, TV show about what? What are we going to do on TV? And I was like, I had another moment. I was like, what can we do on TV? And I was thinking sell houses. And I was like, well, we just bought our first flip. I'm like, what if we flip houses on TV? <laughs> and she shakes her head and walks upstairs. So then I'm like, all right, I got my plan now. Flip houses on TV. So I literally jumped on Google and I put Hollywood production companies and then they came up and I went to websites. I hit casting, sent pictures. I sent uh, what I wanted to do. I wanted to flip houses on TV, went to bed, woke up the next day and one of the production companies wrote back, hey, we like your look. We like what you guys are doing. Send us a home video. So on that first condo of 115,000, I actually filmed the process. So Mm. that shows me electrocuting myself, burning myself (laughs) with acid, like painting the baseboards to the new flooring. Like I did everything wrong and they loved it. So then they're like, we want to do a two day professional shoot, which is called a sizzle reel, which is like three to five minute short version of an episode. Sure. So we had a professional crew come out, made a, made a sizzle reel. They loved it. Mm. So then, so then they take that, they send it to all the networks. They send it to all the networks. Nobody wanted it. Nobody bit. I was like, man, so close, yeah. so close. So I, I'd kind of given up on the, up on the idea. Sure. And, um, this was about, I think. 10 months later. I, lo- I love that you had the idea though. And then you're just like, I'm not even go to sleep. I'm going to go upstairs. I'm oh. going to get online and just start oh. applying. Like there was no hesitation. You just went for it. hundred percent action creates opportunity. Action creates luck. Like there's no yeah. way around it. Like the second, yeah. like I'm not, I'm not kidding. Like the second yeah. I have an idea, yeah. like I can't help myself. I'm sending messages. Yeah. I'm writing notes. I'm, I'm, I'm doing it mm-hmm. because if you wait 20 minutes, it's going to pass and you're probably not going to do 100%. it. One hundred percent. This th- podcast, for example, I was flying home from Turkey like four or five days ago. And I was like, I had this epiphany. I'm like, I need to start my own podcast and my own show. And literally here we are four days later. Wow, this so is four days. I like I'm, that. I'm with you. I'm just That's like, good. hey, let's, let's go all in, you know? Yeah, yeah. So all in. So wh- where was I? Where was I in my story? Oh, so 10 they, months. So you were like, hey, I'm giving up on this. Giving up on it. Yeah. And then 10 months later, I get a call. I'm on the golf course. And the production company's like, you're not going to believe this, but HGTV wants to do a pilot. I'm like, heck yeah, let's do a pilot. Nice. So the third house I ever flipped was the pilot. Wow. And... It so was, you were still green. Oh, I was way green. Like <laughs> wow. third house. I knew nothing. Yeah. Right? So we shot the pilot. Then they're like, it's gonna, it could take a long time to get picked up if it ever sure. does get picked up because sure. the odds are pretty low. A week later, I get an email and I got a contract from HGTV wow. to, to flip 13 houses on national TV in 10 months. That's right? crazy. So it sounds super exciting, right? Yes. Two problems. One, I didn't know how to flip houses. <laughs> and two, I didn't have the money. So... Now I'm staring at this impossible contract and I'm like, man, what am I going to do? So I called the only lawyer I knew, a friend of mine, and I was like, well, what's the worst that could happen? Right. And he's like, well, they could sue you. And I was sitting in my apartment at the time. I kind of looked around on my couch, my furniture. And I was like, man, they can have it. So <laughs> I signed the contract and that was it. And what I did is I burned the boats like I did with everything else in my life. I, failure was not an option. So what I would do is work all day, every day. And I had to buy houses at the auction. So I would work all day and then every night from 10 p.m. to 4 a.m. I would drive Southern California and I would drive by houses that were going to the auction the next day. Mm. The reason I drove by the houses is because I needed vacant houses. I couldn't evict people. Right. You didn't have the time. For the show. I didn't yeah. have the time. So Especially all, in California. Yeah. <laughs> so all night I'm on the road by myself. And here's what happened. I'd drive by all these properties. I'd go to the auction. My max bid on a house is 300000 I'm like, okay, I'm going to get it. Opening bids 200, the next person's 250, then 300, then 350, then 400, then 410. I'm like, wait a minute, I'm at 300. They're at 410. The math doesn't work. I'm never mm-hmm. going to get a house right. because I was, I was compete, competing against the hedge funds. Sure. Chase Merritt specifically, I remember them. They're gone now because they were paying way too much for houses. <laughs> but Chase Merritt was one of the big ones. And um, here's the lesson I learned. Learning to become a successful real estate investor can take a lot of time and dedication, which some people just don't have. If you're one of these individuals, this doesn't mean you can't invest in real estate. My company, Summers Capital, is buying a bunch of boutique hotels right now, and you can invest with us in these deals without having to do any of the work. Our team sources the deals, we secure the lending, we take care of all the renovations, and we even handle all the day-to-day operations with our in-house management company, making it truly hands-off and passive for our investors. If you want to learn more to see if we can help you, go to Summers summerscapital.com slash invest to book a call with our team. Again, that's summerscapital.com slash invest. Now back to the show. The lesson I learned is this. If you keep showing up and taking action, you're going to get lucky. So I kept going every single day. After about two weeks of doing it, I got to the auction. I bid, got to my number. Nobody else bid. No rhyme or reason. I got lucky. Nobody bid on the property except me. And I got a house. So what did I learn? 
I learned that if I take massive action, every now and then I'm gonna get lucky. So that's what I did. I worked 18 hours, 18 hour days to get lucky and I pulled it off. After the first year, I, I, fl I flipped the 13 houses. I did it in a year. And by, by year three, I had done 88 deals. Wow. And so by that time, you're no longer green. Yep. You got a bunch of seasons coming out. And then I believe it was around 2014, you were diagnosed with, with cancer. Can yep. you walk us through, what, what was that like? Oh, that was a, that was a wild experience. Uh, yeah, it was 2000, yeah, 2014, I was going into season two Season one of Flipper Flop had aired, and there was a registered nurse that lived in Texas. Mm. She sent an email to the to the network saying, "Hey, I'm a nurse. Tarek has a lump on his neck. He should get it checked out." Um, I'll never forget the email they sent it to me. They're like, "I don't know if this is a joke, but we wanted to send it to you." Here's the thing: I had already gone to my doctor twice because I was always clearing my throat and I had phlegm, and it was always like felt off. And they gave me nose spray and allergy med. Like they did no testing, nothing. So I was like, "Okay, I'm gonna go to a different doctor." So uh, immediately I went to a different doctor and we did a biopsy. The biopsy came back as atypical, which means it could or could not be cancer, right? So this is mm -hmm. for my thyroid. Sure. So then they wanted to do exploratory surgery. So I did the exploratory surgery. It was supposed to be like an hour. Long story short, I woke up, you know, I think it was like four or five hours later. And I remember opening my eyes and, and then, you know, my family was there. Everybody was crying. <laughs> And then the first words that came out of my mouth was, I have cancer, don't I? And then everybody's like, yeah, you do. Wow. So I had stage three thyroid cancer that had spread to my lymph nodes. So uh, they removed my entire thyroid and a bunch of uh, lymph nodes in my neck. So now, because of this misdiagnosis by my, my doctor, I said, okay, I should probably look at some of my old medical records. And then I noticed um, a year before I had a regular testicle exam during a physical. Mm. And that was it. Like no notes, no referrals. So I was like, just to be case... Uh, just to be safe, I'm going to go check this out. So the wild thing is I was at my thyroid cancer doctor in Irvine in last, in last minute while I was there for my thyroid cancer, they had an opening to do an ultrasound on me, right? Mm -hmm. Just to, to yeah. double check. Yeah. So I went from this cancer doctor, I walked across the hall and I got the ultrasound and I was just, you know, it's not the most comfortable area. So I was like, you know, and it was th this guy was doing it. So I was just talking to him. He's from Huntington beach. He's a surfer and like yeah. younger. And we were just talking, right. Um, uh, while he's doing the, um, what, what, uh, ultrasound. ultrasound yeah. yeah, ultrasound. That's what is that called an ultrasound? Yeah, I think it's called an ultrasound, right? I don't know. I'm not. Or is that for? Or that's for, <laughs> I think or, or that's my for, wife for has those. See, I don't she, know. we have ultrasounds all, mean, the, all the all the <laughs> time now because my wife's pregnant. Yeah, isn't? I think it's an ultrasound. You know, well, whatever it is. Yeah, Anyways, yeah. they they look with uh, technology to see sure, what's going on. Of course. So we're talking, and all of a sudden the guy gets quiet, and I'm like, all right. Well, I'm like, hey, what's going on? He's like, nothing. I'm like, what do you mean nothing? You know, because I'll call people out. I'm like, dude, we've been talking nonstop, and now you're not talking. Yeah. He goes, you're in pain? I'm like, huh? He goes, if you're in pain, you should go to the emergency room. Mm. And right when he said that, my heart dropped. I was like, that's not good. And I said, all right, I'm in pain. Let's wow. go to the emergency room. 20 minutes later, I'm talking to a new doctor, find out I have testicular cancer, and they're booking me for surgery. So at this point, like, I'm, th I'm thinking I'm dead. You know, I'm 31 years old. I, I have two different cancers, and, I and I'm thinking my life's over. And this is a matter of how many months after the first one? Oh, within, like, I think it was like a 90-day period, like That's back crazy. to back. And there were two totally different cancers. One cancer didn't metastasize. They were just two different cancers. Mm. It's crazy because, like, all these things we do to, like, improve our lives, you know, real estate investing and building wealth and relationships with friends and family, like, None of that matters if we don't have our health. Like, I cannot even imagine yeah. what that felt like. Yeah, it, it was tough. And then I remember getting a call from the network. Be like, hey, we understand. Like, we can stop the show. And I'm like, we're yeah. not stopping anything. Love that. Uh, we are not stopping. So if you actually watch the early seasons of, of Flip or Flop, you see me gain 60 pounds on TV. Wow. Like, you, you see me filming sick. Like, I was throwing up every day. And it was a tough experience. But I never quit. Like, I was filming, rolling into my surgery a week after my surgery. I was back on camera and I had a tube coming out of my neck oh. and, I, and I just always fought for what I wanted. And, and I really, that's what it takes to be a successful entrepreneur. Like you have to chase your dreams. And, and I never stopped chasing, even though I had the cancers. Yeah. Wow, man, that's, that's heavy. Well, congrats for, for beating all that. It's uh, definitely an accomplishment. Um, I want to fast forward and switch gears here and kind of talk about what you're doing today. Maybe talk about what your projects are like today and, and what's on your mind. Yeah, sure. So. I'm still shooting uh, season three of Flipping 101, where okay. I'm now teaching people on TV Love how to that. flip houses. Uh, and then my new show, The Flipping El Musa, is guest starring my lovely wife, Heather. Uh, we're, we're filming that right now, and that's gonna, the, both shows will be airing early next year. 
Love and this that. show is going to be so much fun. We're doing higher end flips. They're hour long episodes. We're incorporating the family life. So it's going to be a fun, fun show. And then outside of that, you know, my, my biggest passion is life has in life has always been like coaching, helping and mentoring. And really, I think I got that because 20 year old Tarek wouldn't be who he is today at 41 with, without yeah. that mentor, Mike Ferry and the coaching. Sure. So now I'm passionate about teaching yeah. because I know like if someone teaches you how to do something and if you have drive and motivation, you're going to find success. So because of that, I love teaching people how to flip houses, how to invest in real estate. And a couple of years ago, I started um, a house flipping program called Homeschooled by Tarek. Okay. Uh, and we're teaching students around the country how to invest in real estate. Love that. So um, it's virtual. Yep, yeah. It's yeah. Virtual. Love yeah. That. And then we just started doing live events. So we had a summer school event, a back to school event. Okay. And then we're doing a fall event. Uh, and then another passion of mine is helping people invest their money with real estate. So mm -hmm. I launched this company right here, TEM Capital. Okay. Uh, what and do you guys do? Yeah, we're, we're raising capital uh, to purchase value at apartments. And then also we're developing a self-storage facility out in Surprise, Arizona right now. Love that. So, love so that. yeah, obsessed okay. with commercial, obsessed with yeah. apartments. And just I, I just love real estate. So I love teaching people how to invest or I love you know investing with people. Yeah, I love that. So I do like most multifamily apartments, boutique hotels and, and short term rentals. But uh I'm curious, so like I was gonna ask you, you know, you do a lot of flipping. Along the years, did you ever put loans on these properties and start holding some of these flips? Hey guys, real quick, I hope that you're finding value in this show. If you could do me a huge favor and drop a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or whichever platform you're listening on, it would mean the world to me. Also, if you know of anyone that would potentially benefit from this podcast, feel free to share it with them so we can help more people build wealth through real estate investing. Now back to the show. Yes. You did? Yes, okay. I wish I would've done a lot more, Yeah. but I didn't. Um, so today I own right about uh, me and my business partner about 200 uh, single family rentals across the country uh, and those are self-funded so sure. we bought those we you own know. those we have yeah. 200 um, and then outside of that four apartment buildings um, and then in uh, three in Arizona one in Texas developing the self-storage in Arizona and then I have 40,000 square foot of industrial in Anaheim California love that and so with the commercial stuff, are you partnering with an experienced operator and then you're just bringing the capital? Uh, more than bringing the capital, but yeah. definitely uh, partnering with experienced operators. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So uh, for the self-storage, uh, my partner on that is AJ Osborne. Okay, sure. yeah. I know AJ. Yeah, yeah, yeah. AJ yeah. is awesome. He's just he's just the best guy. I love working with him. He's so, so amazing. Um, and then uh, with apartments, work with different operators too. Uh, we worked with Elevate. Uh, I know Elevate. Yeah, you know yeah. Elevate. We, yeah, we Jorge. Yeah, yeah, I had George. him on my podcast. Yeah, yeah. yeah. he's awesome. Yeah. Such a great guy, him and his partner. So yeah. yeah, man. So just super excited about everything real estate. And yeah. then on top of that, um, I did start working with uh, EXP about a year and a half ago. Okay. And as of this morning, uh, we brought on... Uh, 1,227 agents into our organization. Congrats, so, yeah. man. I love yeah, that. Yeah, so, and then with that, we're, we're teaching real estate agents how to find success through real estate, yeah. how to get more listings, how to work with buyers, how to invest themselves, yeah. how to work with investors. So teaching people how, real estate sales, real estate investing, and then investing their money for them. Yeah, I love that, man. So I'm curious, like, what, what gets you out of bed? Like, obviously, your why before you, you know, got your start in real estate was different than what it is today. And yeah. I always talk about how important it is to have your why and stay true to it. What is your why today? I'm curious. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, my, my why back then was I wanted things, right? Yeah. I wanted Ferraris and Lamborghinis yeah. and mansions. And you know, I ended up getting all those things um, in my in my early 30s. And now I just don't even care. It's funny, like I just, <laughs> right. so I sold like my Lamborghini, my stuff, and I bought a truck and I drove my truck for years and I liked my truck better than I liked my fancy cars, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. So my why today is, is really about leaving my mark on this planet mm. um, and really creating a legacy for my family. You know, I want the family name to continue on long after I'm gone and I want the family taken care of. I want them to have investments and businesses and I want them to have cash flow and security. Yeah. And, and that's my goal. So just to take care of my family for generations to come. And you have two daughters right now and, and one coming, another uh, one coming? I have a, my daughter turns 12 next week. Okay. My son just turned seven and then I have a baby boy on the way. Okay. So does yeah. your 12 year old see you in real estate and is oh, she inspired oh, to do it she's too? a shark. <laughs> yeah. My, my 12 year old walks, runs circles around me. She is going to be the most incredible entrepreneur. I love she that. She has the biggest personality. She's so excited, motivated motivating, sweet, hardworking, intelligent. Like she's been, she's been on TV since she was in her mom's belly. Put it that way. Like uh, the camera comes on and she's a rock star. Yeah. Like it doesn't phase the kids at all because they grew up on TV. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So like she's going to thrive. Both I the kids that. are going to thrive. I love that. Uh, I'm curious cause I don't know the story and I, I know a lot of the listeners are curious as well. Um, how did you meet Heather? Ooh. Cause we know you, you broke up with your ex and what year was that? Uh, we separated 2016. Okay. Yeah. Um, Heather. So 
man, my, my divorce, like I've been through cancers. <clears throat> I've had gnarly back surgery where I was out for like a year and nothing handles, nothing compares to the pain and struggle of, of that divorce. Mm. And, you know, it was very public. We still had to film together. So like I was back to rock bottom again, yeah. you know, multiple yeah. times in my life. And, you know, it didn't take me a month to get over it. It didn't take me two months, six months. It took me years. What was that like filming with your ex? Because it's one thing to live with your ex for a little bit, but to film and like turn it, you got to turn it on for the camera, right? Yeah. What is that like? Uh, very, very difficult. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, was, it was very difficult. Those were really tough years, yeah. man. And, and I was just, I was like, you know, I was walking around just term, terminally depressed uh -huh. all the time for years. And, and then one day, you know, July 4th, 2019, <clears throat> my life changed you know i was on the the back of my boat pulled into this bar called woody's in newport yeah, beach i'm familiar had like 25 <laughs> people having a big party fourth of july and on the outside everybody you know i was a fun guy but inside yeah. i was dying you know yeah, yeah. um and then on a, a boat pull a yacht pulls up next to us and then a girl ran from that boat onto my boat and i'm like mid conversation with someone and i and i see this very beautiful blonde girl <laughs> in the corner of my eye. I literally stopped talking and I looked and I just walked right to her, like beeline, right? Yep. Take, you you want to take action fast. <laughs> so I walk up right away and I stick my hand out. I'm like, hi, I'm Tarek. She goes, I know who you are. And right there, my ego's like, yeah, you do, right? I'm thinking <laughs> I'm a superstar. Right. And she goes, and, and then she turned that around real quick. She goes, you asked me out two years ago. I was like, oh shit. Retreat. I'm like, what do you mean I asked you out two years ago? I was like, where? She's like, on Instagram. I was like, hold on. So I just, I spun around and I put my back to her and I looked up her name and I was like, oh, I did. And she was, she had responded that she had a boyfriend. So I looked back, I'm like, hey, you still got that boyfriend? <laughs> and she's like, no. I'm like, okay, we're back. We're good. I was like, so I was like, well, let's go out. She's like, like, do what? I'm like, I don't know. You want to go to Paris? And she looked at me. She's like, no. I'm like, well, why not? She's like, I'm not sleeping in a bed with you. I didn't say you're going to sleep with me. I said, you're going to go to Paris. With right. Me. And she's like, no. I'm like, all right, well, what about Vegas? We can go to Vegas. And she goes, I'm not leaving town with you. I don't know you. <laughs> But I'll get on your boat. Yeah. <laughs> and then I said, fine, fine. I was like, I was like, what about dinner? She, she goes, goes, maybe. I'm, I'm like, all right, we're, we're getting, getting somewhere. somewhere. So, so we, we start talking for a few minutes. minutes. And then some drunk girl on my boat offended her. <laughs> and then she left. I'm like, come oh. on. So I'm like, now I'm like sulking and pouting in like in the cockpit or the helm or whatever you call that thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you were cock blocked in the cockpit. <laughs> yeah. Clearly, I don't drive the boat. Yeah. Um, I just ride in the boat. <laughs> so then I'm like, man, this this sucks. And I'm pretty like I'm a little irritated at this point. And I look out the window of my my boat. And I see her on the front of the boat next to me with some other like good looking guy, like <laughs> chatter up. She's throwing her hair back laughing. I'm like, well, hell no. As I am not going down like that. So then I'm like looking at my control panel and I'm looking for the horn. A few drinks to eat. Oh, yeah. I find the horn and I lay on the horn. And this thing's loud. Yeah. And all of a sudden, and I, and I have it on video. And, and I scared them. They both jumped and they both looked right at me. And I looked at the guy and I go like this. And I said, get off. And I stick my head out the window and I said, get off my Kool Aid. <laughs> <laughs> that's so obnoxious oh man. i really liked her so then i walk outside the boat and then she actually liked it wow yeah and then, and then they, and i was like i was like hey sorry dude but you're talking to my future wife and he's like oh we're good man he's like, and he goes by the way love your shows i'm like thank you wow. so then she gave me her number and she thought it was cute that i honked the horn at her for talking to another guy and I then yeah and then we had our, our first dinner and then she canceled our first dinner i got a text in the morning i'm like man and i I sent her a message. I was like, listen, I'm different than you think. I promise you got to give it a shot. I'm different than you think. So she's like, fine. I'll do, I won't do dinner with you, but I'll go, I'll go for a drink. So then we go out for a drink. I had just come back from South Africa. I'm like totally jet, jet lagged. And then I was like a, a complete psychopath on our first date. I had like so much anxiety and like yeah. I have a heat problem. Like we were talking about yeah, earlier. Yeah, I do too. And listen, like <laughs> I know when I look good and I have this one blue sweater I wear every Christmas where I know I look good. <laughs> So our first date is in July in a heat wave in LA. Guess what I wore? The same sweater. The same sweater. <laughs> so the entire dinner, I'm thinking, man, I'm just, I can feel the beads of sweat dripping down my forehead. <laughs> and I'm just like a sweaty mess. And I'm like going to the bathroom every two minutes, trying to calm down. And, and finally I come back, she, she looks at me, she's like, she, she's, like she's kind of entertained because I'm a psychopath. Right. And she's like, are you okay? <laughs> and, I'm like, and I looked right at her, I'm like, I am not okay. Not at all. She goes, let's get drunk. I'm like, I like that answer. So then we ended up having drinks. We ended up hanging out for like six hours, went bar hopping, oh, had that. such a fun night. Um, three days later, uh, we had our second date. We got outed by TMZ because we accidentally crashed a private birthday party. <laughs> That's wow. a whole other story. <laughs> Look out. Um, and then within a week, we were living together. Wow. How did you guys crash the private birthday oh party? I want to hear that story. 
Man, I, so I sent the, the boat from Newport to Marina Del Rey. I was supposed to meet her and her friends at noon because okay. I was filming. My filming got pushed. I didn't show up till five. So everybody had been having fun and drinking all day. And I was late to the party. So we just took the boat out. And I'm used to taking the boat out to Orange County. Sure. And we're up in LA and then we go to Redondo Beach. And then we pull into the harbor and there's this like huge outdoor bar with a live band and yeah. food. We're like, this looks fun. And yeah. like, we're in love. And like, so right. I'm not thinking about things, of right? Course. I just see a lot of people. Yeah, let's roll. So we get off the boat. We go in, we open the gate to this uh, party and we go in and we're having drinks and dancing. Next thing I know, I realize we're at a private birthday party. <laughs> They're singing happy birthday. Oh I'm my like, gosh. okay, this is a problem. So we left the birthday party and that's where we got outed. Woke up the next day. We were all over TMZ, Tariq with Mystery Blonde. And then the rest is history. That's how it all started, huh? That's how it all started. Did you guys ever go to Paris? Yes, we did. <laughs> yes, date, we did. Date number three? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Month three. But I, yeah. I made her go to Paris. And I totally wasn't kidding. I would have taken her to Paris. Yeah, love that. Love yeah. that. Well, as we get to the end of the show, man, I want to know, like, what's next for you? Great question. Well, I'm very excited um, about spending more time with my family. Yeah. So in order to do that, I really have to focus on scaling the company and bringing the right people to help to help us do that. Mm. Um, so that's something that's very important to me. Uh, when it comes to TV, I'm going to continue uh, doing my shows on HGTV. But uh, eventually, I'd like to start doing entrepreneur shows, business shows. You know, myself, I, I own multiple companies, so I just love being an entrepreneur. Um, and other than that, just buying as much real estate as humanly possible yeah yeah uh, and that's and that's the, that's some of the big goals you know i want to buy just thousands and thousands of apartments and houses and self-storage units and that's yeah. the goal yeah i'm curious what, what's your take on where we are in the market cycle right now you know obviously interest rates have come up there's a lot of inflation mm -hmm. transactions have slowed down um but it's really not changing the supply and demand uh off balance that we have right now so i wanted yeah. to get what are your thoughts where do you see us navigating through the next couple of years you know, well, the truth is nobody can predict it because yeah. we're at the mercy of the government. The entire market is rate based. If mm. the rates drop to 2%, prices are going to go way up. 100%. If the rates go up to 8%, prices, they're going to go way down. So right. nobody has control. It's all the government, yeah. right? But here's a lesson I learned. In 2006, I bought a house in Charlotte, North Carolina, four bedroom, two bath, 2,200 square foot. Love that market. My first rental property paid 160,000 for it. And I remember thinking, I can't even build this thing for 160. And entry level homes in California back then were like 600. So I was like, this, there's impossible to lose money. Right. So I bought that in 2006. By early 2008, it was worth 80,000 bucks. I was like, <laughs> man, I bought this thing at the worst time. Yeah. I am screwed for the rest of my life. I'm never going to make money. I should foreclose. I should short sale. And I never did. And this is why I say this is my most valuable lesson in real estate. So I decided not to get rid of the property. I kept it. I was negative cash flow, like 200 bucks a month which was affecting me back then because that's when I was struggling. Yep. But I fought for it. Today, 12 years later, the house is worth 365,000. I paid 160, went right. down to 80, and now it's worth 365. Right. When I when I bought it, the rents were 1150. When we were full on into the recession, it was down to 950. Today it's at 2100. Yeah. So what I learned is this, you only lose money when you sell. If you sell. Right. It doesn't like I, do, like I have 200 houses today, right? Yeah. Do I do I care if the prices dropped 20%? No, I no. don't because I'm not planning on selling those. As long as I have tenants in place, as long as I'm getting cash flow, as long as I'm getting depreciation, yeah. I know over time they will always be worth more. Yeah. And that's the beautiful thing. And then once you have more, once you have a portfolio of 50 million, right? Or 100 million, the market goes up 20% a year. Yeah. How much equity did you make? 20 million bucks. 100%. Right? And then what can you do with that equity? Well, you can borrow up to 70%. So you can borrow 14 million against the new 20. Yeah. Well, what do you do with that 14 million? You spread it across more real estate to get yeah. more cash flow. It's a and it's just this beautiful circle. Real estate buys you more real estate. That's it. I tell people all the time, I'm like, you know what? Like, as long as you're buying for three things, buy for cash flow, yep. secure long-term debt, and have plenty of cash reserves, you can ride out any recession. And yep. who cares what happens in the short to midterm? If you're going to hold it 10 plus years, you know it's going to go up over time. I've also had an epiphany, like just a change in perspective recently. Before I was always like cash flow, cash flow, cash flow. But uh, recently I just realized, you know what? Like the equity growth is really what builds the wealth. Because let's say you buy two properties, right? Property A, 
you might not have any cash flow for a year, but you're renovating it, you're forcing your appreciation, and you're going to create a million and a half of equity. Um, but then this other property, it provides you know three thousand dollars a month in cash flow, but it's not going to go up much in value because you bought it at market, right? Yep. That's thirty six thousand dollars a year in cash flow. Well, how many years of thirty six grand a year? in cash flow is it going to take to make that 1.5? I'm so glad you said that because I've always been historically more of an equity buyer versus yeah. a cash flow buyer. Yeah. Because I'm like, okay, my cash, okay, so on a house, my cash flow is maybe $300 a month less, but my appreciation could be a half million dollars more. 100%. Right? Or a thousand, like, so for me, so now I'm, I try to, it's a fine line. So yeah. I own, I think about thir uh, 35 rentals in California, yeah. but then I don't buy them in California anymore just because they're too expensive. Yeah. And then the rest I own out of state, but uh -huh. I'm a big believer in, so my plan really is when the market's doing what it's doing right now, buy for cash flow. Yeah. When the mar when the market, if the market drops, yeah. well, it's going to drop eventually. It yeah. always does. That's when I'm buying for equity. Right. So what I'm going to do is buying for cash flow now. If we do hit a really bad recession, I'm going to buy for equity because when it goes back up, right. I'm going to sell all the equity and then I'm going to buy more passive yeah, assets that makes for sense. the cash flow. That makes sense. Yeah. yeah, I had this change of perspective. I bought a, uh, a 1031 out of a 32 unit building in Indianapolis in January. I bought a luxury home in Scottsdale, 1.3 acres, 7,600 square feet. And I was like, okay, I'm going to do a full renovation. Here it had go. great bones. And then I'm going to refi and then hold it in short term rental. So we put, bought it for 2.4, put in about 800. And uh, I'm thinking ARV is about three five, three six. I'm telling the appraisers last week. I'm like, hey, really need three eight, three nine, but three five works, right? Mm -hmm. The appraiser calls me last week. He goes, you need to be at three eight. I'm like, yeah. He goes, I got you at four eight nine. Oh, I'm like, what the heck? What the heck? Isn't that and that was when I had this epiphany. I'm like, holy shit. Yeah, there was no cash flow for six months, but I just created a million and a half equity. Have you ever missed on your ARV that much? Uh, <laughs> well, I'm sure I have. <laughs> you know, okay. So I, I love that you said that. I'll tell you another funny story. Yeah. So the, the biggest deal I've ever done was my commercial build, my first ever commercial building in Anaheim. I bought that one seven years ago. Mm -hmm. And I remember at the time I was so scared to buy it because it was 4.9 million. Yeah. It was a huge buy. Yeah. We got an SBA loan. We only put 500,000 down for a $5 million asset. Can't beat that. Today, we just got it appraised at $13.5 million, Ooh, my man. paid 4.9. So another thing that used to scare me was flipping houses that were too expensive. Mm -hmm. But now, no, because you can, that's where you make the big pop. That's where right? the big pops so are. I, yeah. It's just, and it all comes down to experience. And yeah. I will say the only way to get experience is by actually doing. doing the only way to yeah. actually do is to get started. Most people, they just never start. They, they talk about starting, they watch videos, they read books, but they never actually do. Yeah. And I always say the only way to do it is to actually do it. Yeah. So in your estimation, what do you think separates those who are successful in real estate versus those who never even get started or they give up? Action. One word. Just taking action. I mean, come on. Is yeah. real estate rocket science? Yeah. It's I mean, not. It? It's not. It, it's honestly like people pay $200,000 to go to universities and colleges. Oh and what do you learn? What do you learn? Like history and science and biology. Now, like, why do I need to learn that kind yeah. of stuff? But then if you just invest two years into educating yourself in real estate, not even yeah. one year. I mean, that gives you the, the knowledge that it takes to just build massive wealth. Yeah. It's insane. And, and here's the difference, right? Yeah. Like think back to high school. I always go back to high school. Yeah. In high school, we learned calculus. We learned algebra. Yeah. We learned chemistry. Well, why were we able to learn all that stuff? The school made us. Yeah. We had no choice. <laughs> right. The problem is we become adults and no one's making us do it anymore. Yeah. And because no one's making us do it, we're just not doing it. Yeah. So that's why it's really important to own your shit and like do it for yourself and like hold yourself accountable. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think a lot of people are lacking that. Right. I mean, it's really simple. Real estate investing in a nutshell. Well, you got to generate leads. Right. Yeah. So what do you have to do to generate leads? What you have to make bunch of contacts, right? Mm -hmm. The more contacts you make, the more leads you're going to get. The more leads you're going to get, the more deals you're going to get. The yeah. more deals you're going to get, the more money you're going to make. It's a very simple formula. It is. But most people, they, they just don't get started. Yeah. Or they get started and they don't see immediate success and then they move on. Yeah. But you're so right. You could teach it to a 12 year old. Yeah. Anyways, my man. Hey, listen, such a pleasure chatting with you. Thank you so much for having us over. And um, where can the listeners get in touch with you or learn more about you and, and your flipping programs? Sure, absolutely. Um, the best place to find me is on uh, social media. Probably uh, Instagram is at the real Tarek El Musa. The real because someone stole my name. Uh, so that's a good spot. And then um, uh, for to invest with me for accredited investors, it's temcapital.co. 
And then uh, for <clears throat> real estate education, it's homeschooled by Tarek.com. Awesome. Listeners, be sure to check him out. He is Tarek El Musa. I am Rich Summers, signing off. Mm-hmm.